That's good. Now, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's good to be here on the Sabbath day, bright and shiny outside. Um, brand new day. Brand new day. I uh, I was waking Jesse up this morning, and I said. Happy birthday! She said, you're crazy. It's four months away. I said, this is a brand new day. I'm just saying happy birthday to the day. And it's good to be here today. And uh, I do want to say hi to uh, Brother Chris. He's not with us today, but um, uh, he'll see this online. So, uh, praise Yahweh. It's good to be here. Uh, will you bow your heads with me as we uh, uh, just open up our service today? And... Uh, so, Yahweh, King of the universe, we come to you today on your, your appointed day on Sabbath. Uh, this is a day that you said, set it aside, remember it, count it as holy, holy, consecrated unto you. And today we gather here in this place, in your name. And uh, Father, I just ask that you would touch each one today. Each one, we have come to hear your instruction for the coming week. We have come to um, be re-energized by your spirit. We have come to be with our brothers and sisters to encourage and uh, to let our gifts, uh, the gifts flow, the gifts that you have put inside of us. So Father, we, we gather here today and we, we just thank you. We thank you and we invite your presence in this place and uh, just let your word fall on ears that hear. And uh, Father, let us just hear your voice today. We thank you. We give you praise. In Yeshua, Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, stand with me. Let us, uh, let us praise and worship in this one song today.
holy God. Uh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Good to see smiling faces. Uh, good to be here. Anybody needs a Bible study, they are in the back there. Raise your hand. Uh, or uh, an announcement. No, everybody's got one. Everybody with me. Okay, we are going to learn one of the greatest attributes of Yahweh God today, um, one that has affected us um, the greatest, and that is His mercy, His mercy. And uh, so this morning, um, as we see, of course, one of His attributes that we were just singing about is that He is holy. And uh, he calls us to be merciful. So, so learning to be merciful. Learning to be merciful. Hey, is that is that a hard thing sometimes for you? Yes. To dish out mercy? <laughs> um, I think it is for, for many of us. Uh, but we have to understand how much mercy was um, dealt out to us. Once we realize that, um, it's a little bit easier to uh, hand out mercy to those that, uh, that are around us. So, it says, learning to be merciful. So, everybody, you've heard, you've heard, Lord have mercy, right? Everybody's probably said that or heard that said. Um, <laughs> nah. You forget, Lord have mercy on me. Yeah, yeah, says that, on, on me, me. <laughs> yes, yes. Lord have mercy on me. Um, this is an expression that we all have heard at different times and under different circumstances. However, if it were not for God's mercy towards the children of men, we all would be in, in terrible circumstances. We have a great lesson to learn from our Creator. For if He is plenteous in mercy, and He certainly expects no less of us who serve Him. So uh, here we have the key text today is uh, one of the Beatitudes, um, and it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Matthew 5 and 7. And uh, that's uh, um, just one of those, one of those laws that uh, Yahweh God put in effect. What you sow is what you reap. Um, so if you deal out mercy... We're going to receive mercy. Um, if you deal out judgment, we're going to receive judgment. So, mercy. Mercy. Number one says the act of showing mercy is the voluntary withholding of some penalty for one who deserves to have it imposed upon him. Man. Don't we like to see somebody get justice? Man, they deserve that. In our mind, so we can look at people and say, well, they deserved exactly what they got. Is that dealing out mercy? Did I, when, when dealing with, with Yahweh God, did we deserve or did we get exactly what we deserve. I don't think so. I don't think so. And as we look down through this, we're going to find out um, more and more of how, how much His mercy, how much He dealt mercy out to us. And, uh, okay, so uh, it says we find this, um, we find this in the case with Yahweh, who despite the fact that His people deserve punishment, often withheld that punishment. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 15 through 22. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 15 through 22. Nehemiah was a man called to, uh, out of, 
Babylon. He was of Babylonian captivity. He was a, a Jew that had been dispersed up there and uh, the Lord God had called him back to Jerusalem to uh, build the defenses of Jerusalem, to build a wall back in there. And uh, so there was people coming back out of uh, out of Babylon, back into Jerusalem. And uh, this is the time frame that we're, we're looking at. And uh, um, so, Sister Helen, would you read Nehemiah 9, 15 through 22, and uh, just see what it says here in Nehemiah. Okay. And made us then to them on the Okay, as, uh, as he goes down through there, he's, he's telling about the, uh, um, the stiff-neckedness of the Israelites. They had continually um, rebelled against what, uh, uh, what Yahweh God had told them uh, and asked them to do, and the statutes and the, and the commandments and the decrees that he had put before them. But he was compassionate. He, he always provided for them. Uh, in the wilderness, what he he gave them water to drink. He gave them manna from heaven. Um, their clothes didn't wear out. Did you notice that? And their feet did not swell. Um, they were walking in the wilderness for forty years. Um, and uh, I, I found this. Uh, uh, it, it should have took them twelve days to get to the promised land. Twelve days. And it took them 40 years. Um, let's make the decision to be obedient and be 12 days. Yes. And not 40 years to get to where God wants to take us. Uh, but even in that, even in that rebellion, um, He was gracious to them. He loved them. Um, he provided for them. Um, so uh, He is compassionate. He is merciful. He is a loving God. You know, a lot of times we look at the Old Testament and many people will say that, uh, well, the God of the Old Testament was a God of war and a God of judgment and a uh, God that uh, was strict and uh, come down hard on you. And uh, He brought the law and uh, just pounded it on top of your head. But as we see here, um, you know, the same... God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament is the same God in the New Testament. Same. Jesus, Yeshua, in the flesh. Jesus is God in the flesh. Amen. He's the same God as it is, that He was in the Old Testament. Yahweh. Um, and He is compassionate. And He loves us. And uh, He is merciful. Um, I want you to just turn to this one... Uh, I've added to your Bible study today a little bit. I want you to go to Exodus chapter 34. Just look at uh, what Yahweh, God, had proclaimed to Moses 
about who he was when we give him the commandments for the second time. Uh, I want you to go to 34, look at 6 and 7. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate, the gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving the wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And sin. We're in the Old Testament. This is who he always was, and he always is. He is full of mercy. Full of mercy. Uh, always ready to forgive. Um, forgive our sin. And He maintains that covenant with us. Even though when we're faithless, He is faithful. Um, so Yahweh, number two there, Yahweh God is always ready to forgive. This is what is meant by the phrase of Scripture. For His mercy endureth Forever. How many are glad this morning that His mercy endureth forever? Have you been stiff-necked in your, in your walk with God? Um, I can tell you I have. Um, I have. And I am glad that He doles out mercy to me. Um, so it says, discuss the merciful nature of God. Let's look at Psalm 85, or 86 and 5. Sister Jesse. Psalms 86. You've got to wait for me. You've got to get there. I guess I've got to get an iPhone. Right? Electronic brain. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive, and in abundant mercy, and to those who call upon you. Okay, those who call upon you. We need to call upon Him. That is a, um, that is kind of a, a prerequisite in that, uh, in that promise. He said He's always ready to forgive, but we need to call out on Him. And uh, ask for forgiveness. Repent of uh, the sins that we have in our life. And He's always ready to, to dole out mercy. So let's look at 118. Psalms 118. Verses 1 through 4 and verse 29. Okay, he wants you to get it. He, he repeats himself. Um, the Holy Spirit has that repeats when when uh, when he wants us to to get it. There is uh, repetition in Scripture. To say it over and over and over again, um, where we will in English bold letter it or put it in uh, italic. Uh, in Scripture, you'll see where He wants you to get it, He repeats it um, so that you hear it, see it over again. His mercy endures forever. Does that does that mean um, you've done any you've ever done anything that He cannot dole out mercy for? Nothing. Nothing in your life. Nothing in your life, if you come with a whole heart to Him, um, will He not forgive and dole out mercy to you. Uh, that is who He is. That is um, 
that is a prince or a principle of him, that is a characteristic of him that I want you to understand. And endure, he endures, his mercy endures forever. Um, let's look at Nehemiah 9. Um, and I changed that. Uh, I'm going to want to go 29 through 33. And uh, so we are going to share. Nehemiah chapter 9. Read verses 29 through 33. And admonish them in order to turn them back to your law. Yet they acted arrogantly and did not listen to your commandments, but sinned against your ordinances, by which if a man observes them, he shall live. And they turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not listen. However, he bore with them for many years and admonished them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore, he gave them into the hand of the people of the land. Nevertheless, in your great compassion, you did not make an end of them or forgive <coughs> them, for you are a gracious and compassionate Yahweh. Now, therefore, are Yahweh the great, the mighty, the awesome, Yahweh who keeps covenant and loving kindness. Do not let the, all the hardships seem insignificant before you, which has come upon us, our kings, our princes, our priests, our prophets, our fathers, of on all of your people for the days of the kings of Assyria to this day. However, you are just in all that has come upon us. You, for you have dealt faithfully, but we have acted with wickedly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, he always acts faithfully. Um, does anybody have a, uh, uh, a testimony to that? Something they'd like to share today? We'll put you on the spot. Um, something that uh, uh, that you can share with us where he has been merciful and always acted faithfully even even maybe if he were quite so faithful um, anybody at all you tap it into your brain this morning uh, get you woke up well I can you know it's just our testimony you know um a lot of us didn't grow up in church or know of Yahweh God until, you know, later in our lives. And, and he was just merciful. He was there all the time, and he knew the timing of it. And and when we stopped and turned and repented and, and yielded to him, you know, he didn't, he, in our uh, innocence and not knowing him, you know, he didn't slay us or kill us, but he it was all in his timing, and, and he was merciful and patient, long-suffering. For, for me, I tested, <laughs> unbeknownst, now I see how holy he is, you know. He's very merciful for, to me. Amen. Yeah, anybody else? Um, where his mercy um, was just most abundant. To you that he told, yeah, yeah. I think that anybody that was past the age of two before he got saved would have to testify that he was merciful. But yes. uh, when I, you know, I was 27 before I came to my senses, before he, he really got a hold of me, and I just, I can't believe the number of times that I should have literally, and I'm not, you know, trying to be dramatic, but I should have been dead. And I mean, I didn't even, it wasn't my goal, but I mean, everything that I did should have ended up, and many, many times came close, but it just, I mean, I was in some pretty raunchy situations and never hardly got a scratch. Yeah. yeah so, yes. yeah, pretty mind-boggling. Yeah, he is, he is um, a merciful God. Uh, yes? Well, I know, even if you do grow up in a household of faith, of your dad being an evangelist and your mom being your um, teacher of faith, and you still have those times where you, you try it out, you know, and you wonder and but then it comes back to all the times we rode horses drove cars all the accidents that happened and now we were so merciful to us yeah well the horses jumped us instead of stepped on us and we watch these videos you know wearing the helmet and how these horses step on the guy's head you know all kinds of kick the guy's head as he tries to get over it and those things didn't happen to us 
you know. And, and then other times, you know, like my sister was in a bad car accident, a semi. Her boyfriend pulled out in front of a semi and smacked their car, sent it into a spin. The seat belts broke, the car the seats were smashed into the back seats. My sister got a bad um, cut from it on her head. Cali um, delivered her and was merciful. Um, there was just there's just so many times where Yahweh took care of us. Or there was a snake, all of us kids walked over. Right, you know, a snake on the I can't remember if it was a bad snake or what it was, but we all stepped over, you know, and then the last one finally seen it and says, You guys, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> well he took care of us, you know, we were growing up, but he was merciful. Yeah. And I can look back now, and even now in my life with raising my children, how Yahweh's been merciful. Yes. And he's healed us. And, um, it just, to me, sometimes it's kind of like faith is a perception, helps you to perceive Yahweh's will in your life, rather than us focusing on the problems. I mean, the faith is kind of like giving up and letting Yahweh take care of it. Yes. You're not really giving up, but you're saying, it's not within me, Yahweh. If this mountain is to be removed out of my life, you're going to have to do it, even if you do it one pebble at a time that mountain's going to slide. Mm -hmm. To me, that's, that's my faith in him, that he can do it. I mean, it looks impossible. <coughs> so I can see Yahweh's mercy and even allowing me to, to um, have that faith. Amen. Amen. Yes, mercy on all of us is fly every day. And you know, walk out the door. It's, you know, I've been going before, you know, a few weeks ago I was going to the fire and this week, he's been just blessing me every step, every step I made. It couldn't make it my heart move, move, and it's just like, you know, thank you, Lord. And he, you know, I could have just walked away, and he wasn't even allowed that. You know, and so he was merciful. He worked with me through, through others and, and just different things, you know. Um, even when I was married, um, Stephen, uh, he was blown off of a water tank literally blown off, set on fire, and they left him for dead. God was merciful. And he come home, and they, they said, well, what are you doing here? He was helping put out the fire. God was merciful to him. He was to the point, too, he, I come home one day, and he had two fingers cut off. I mean, literally, they were just hanging there. And a gulf full of blood, and he says, you need to take me to the emergency room. And I'm thinking, well, what did you just, why did you come here? Come over to the hospital and wait for me, because I, I had other things to do. God showed me I needed to, for some reason, I went home. We went there. I signed papers to have his fingers, and still didn't see to have his fingers cut off. As he was laying on the operating table, we were all praying. And the doctors, just as they were getting ready to take him, his fingers moved. And the doctor said, try to move your fingers again. He moved his fingers, and he just went back on. Yeah. yeah. God was merciful. And and that's just to him, but he was also merciful to me, knowing what I was going to go through if something happened. You know, so he showed mercy to us. But then the minute we wake up to him, time to go to bed and he's still sleeping. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. Anybody else? Yes.
on everything, on the ship. It was one of them old, old time ship things. And I just hollered out, God help me. He, he got scared. And he said, just set it out. He said, I'll let you out. He had threatened to, to, to shoot me or stab me, he said, if I screamed every time a car would go by. Uh, and uh, anyhow, he stopped long enough. And I got out of the car, ran behind the car, and he tried to back over me. And I kept going. I knocked on the first house I could come to, and no, no answer. And I just kept going through fields and through everything until I got home. But I praise God, He delivered me way back then. I wasn't really living for Him. I, I was brought up. Uh, don't work on Sunday because you'll have bad luck all week. This is kind of the attitude then. But uh, God delivered me, and I have learned through that, through any. And I say to anyone who talk about. You know, the dangers here in Billings now, or Sydney now. And uh, I said, you can have mace, you can have a gun, you can have anything, but his greatest defense is say, God help me. He'll mm -hmm. deliver you. He just will. Mm -hmm. I feel a whole lot of that. I praise God for his mercy, even when I wasn't really living for him. Mm -hmm. God is so good. Yeah. Amen. I don't say that too much, but <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. Amen. That is. Uh that's quite a testimony. I, uh, that just brings us back to Psalms 116. It says, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. Yes. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Amen. 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 All right. The example of mercy which God set for us reached its zenith in that one unfathomable act of mercy that he manifested when he sent his son to save us while we were yet sinners. Let's go to 1 John 4, 9, and 10. asking us to do to our friends, to our neighbors, to our families to those that he puts around us um, once we get a concept or once we get a, at least get a glimmer uh, or an idea of what he has done for us um, it gives you uh, a basis on what um, on how we are to be to others and how he wants you to be to others have mercy. Have mercy on them. Um, let's look at Titus. Verse, chapter 3, verses uh, 4 through 7. Titus. Life. 
with Him. With Him. Um, I would say that is uh, most abundant mercy. Most abundant mercy. Um, if God has withheld a just, eternal death from us, by His mercy through Jesus Christ, should we not then be equally anxious to show mercy one to another? Even when others have wronged us, we should have the godlike attitude of being ready to forgive. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. Reciprocate that 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 uh, that blessing that He gave us. That we are to reciprocate that uh, to our fellow man, being merciful. Um, let's look at the, the next one, Colossians three thirteen. Sister Helen. So, he's saying, bear with each other, is uh, the way that it says in the NIV. <laughs> is that hard to do sometimes? Yeah. To bear with each other? It's very hard, and especially, I've had that to happen to me this week. I had, had something happen on Tuesday, and um, this person just walked out. She didn't know me just walk out that day, she walked out the second day. And so I just came and said, well, I guess she's just done. She came into my office yesterday and she started talking to me and she explained to me what happened. And so we had a talk. And so I told her she had a job that well. Then I had to go out and tell the rest of the staff what I had done. And they're the ones that said, are you crazy? And I said, you know, we all make mistakes. And, you know, I just, she has her reasons and I have my reasons for, you know. So I can, and then someone later walked by and says, says did she do that? I said, she, yeah, she's just being kind. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm thinking, well, what does that mean? You're just being, <laughs> she's just being kind. And I said, well, you know, we do. We all make mistakes and God forgave us, you know. And yes, I might be making a second mistake, but maybe not. You know, God changed me. He can change them too as well. The same, another thing that happened was one of my girls quit, and yes, I celebrated <laughs> that she was leaving, but I still did go and wait for her. I'm like, wait, why did you do that? And I said, because I hope her well. And her new adventure and things, you know, I don't really, you know, it was not a nice fit for me, but where she's going, maybe it'll be a better fit. And, uh, so, yeah, I, I did go to LA and I bought a gift and we bought cards and the rest is like, I don't even want to sign a card. I said, well, that's your, you know, but I'm going to do this. I did and I said, well, that's Connie and Connie again. So that, that, brings, that brings me to a point. You, what you just said, is mercy a choice? It, it is a choice. It is our it is our choice. We can deal it out, or we can keep it to ourselves. Um, and what you were doing was you were choosing to deal out mercy. Um, so God chose. He chose. 
He chose to deal it out to each one of us that are sitting here today. Um, and I, I thank Him for that. I thank Him for His mercy. Amen. I thank Him for His, his love. Um, there was uh, um, a commentary I was just looking at, and, and the one thing they said about mercy was uh, it is sacrificial love. Sacrificial love. That's what mercy is. And because that's what that's what Yahweh God gave to us. He sacrificed so that we could receive eternal life with Him. Because without it, without that sacrificial love that He showed us, we would not have it. We would not have eternal life with Him because the wages of sin are death. That's what the Word of God says. The wages of sin is death. But through Him, through His mercy, what, what Yeshua did for us, what Jesus did, um, we have this, this everlasting life, this gift that He has given to us um, through His mercy. Uh, we be if he didn't give us mercy. We did. He say to us, "Okay, you messed up. Get out of here. <laughs> Don't let the door hit you on the way out." Right? Get. If he didn't deal out mercy, most of us wouldn't make it past the age of thirteen, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe even younger. younger. <laughs> but thirteen is the age of accountability. As soon as you become accountable for your actions, why most of us wouldn't. Be dead. Because the wages of sin are dead. But because of his mercy. So mercy and forgiveness that spring from the heart are expressed cheerfully and willingly without pretense or demand. That's the way mercy is to be dealt out because uh, we are supposed to give it freely from our heart. This is the way that Yahweh God gives to us freely from His. So expand upon the true godly expression of mercy. I want you to go to Romans 12 verse 8. And uh, I want you to read No, go ahead and read just eight, but go ahead. He who exhorts with exhortation, he who gives with liberty, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Okay. Now, uh, in this in this context of, of verse or of chapter twelve, uh, from about verse five or so, or, or verse four, it says for uh, I'm starting at verse 4 in chapter 12. It says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts. So within the context of, of that, uh, uh, of those verses, and she and uh, Jesse wrote, or read the last part of that, it says if we show... Um, this is a gift. Mercy is a gift from, from Yahweh. It is, uh, it is something that uh, um, when you receive the Holy Spirit, um, that you should see in your life. You should see mercy um, becoming more apparent in your life. Um, what... Who can raise their hand and say, before, before the Holy Spirit, before Jesus come into my life, um, that I was merciful? Who can say that? Who, nobody can raise their hand and say you were merciful before, before Christ came into your life. Well, and, and since then, has mercy... Has that fruit showed up in your life? 
everybody, can everybody say yes? Yes. 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 It has. Well, I know it has. Because this is this is part of um, what happens in your life. You become more merciful. Now I think there are people like this scripture is saying that there are people that have the gift of mercy. There are, there are people that have mercy to a greater degree um, than I do. They have more of that, that gift from the Holy Spirit. But each one of us, each one of us, because we receive the Spirit of God, have received mercy and are to deal this mercy out. Um, so it says, show mercy and do it cheerfully. Do not be, um, do not give it grudgingly. Can you give mercy grudgingly? Man, I gotta say, I gotta give you mercy. You just stole twenty dollars from me. <laughs> But I've got to give you mercy. Hmm. Because I stole and did wrong against my God. And when people do that to us, when they steal, when they lie, when they cheat, we are to be emulating God. We are to deal out that mercy. And I'm, you need to ask the Holy Spirit how to deal it out. That's the wisdom. That's the wisdom that you that you need to have. And if you hear a voice said, say, crush them, that's not the Holy Spirit. That's not the Holy Spirit, yes. Well, if you think about mercy and dealing with your children, um, Love should not be a reward. You should give, so mercy and love should not be a reward. It should be given whether they're good or bad. And how to deal with, you know, how to give that out and make your child realize you love them no matter whether they're good or bad. That's more of a soothing antidote than, you know, always punishing them. To somehow realize that's how Yahweh has dealt with us. Sometimes we and have to. love to us. Mercy, mercy, you know, we should be punished for, you know, all the mistakes we have made, all the sins we've committed. But yet he has given mercy. And even through the Old Testament, he says, I, I ran after you. I, I tried to draw you with cords of love. But many times it was like, well, the more he ran after them, the further they ran away from him. <laughs> to me, that doesn't really make sense. But he was trying to say he was merciful. He loved them. Long before he finally said, you know, I've had enough. So in my mind, it's like, well, to my children, love is not a reward to them. It should just be a part of I, I, you know, I forgive them no matter how many times they do something. They ask me if I forgive them. I always forgive them because it doesn't matter. It's, it's a process of what do you say, life? Unconditional. That's unconditional. That's, that's not on what. That's not what you do. Whatever you do, I still, I'm still going to love. Um, I I love you. It's what you've done. I don't like you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it has nothing to do with whether I love you or not. I always love you no matter what you do. But what you have done is wrong. So you can tell the difference. You know, it's the deed, not you yourself. And there's consequences to um, to our deeds. But that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that God doesn't love us. Right? We still got to deal with the consequences of our choice. Um, so, uh, unconditional. The showing of mercy is one of the qualities of wisdom that comes from God. 
If our lives are led by the Spirit of God, we will be full of mercy and easy to be entreated. So let's look at James 13, 17, and 18. James 3, 3 verses 17 and 18. things, those attributes there, um, mercy, considerate, peace-loving, pure, um, these are all things, these are all attributes, fruit from, from the Spirit in your life, and uh, mercy is one of those uh, big ones for, for a lot of people, um, sometimes it's hard to give mercy, deal out mercy to people around you because you think they should be uh, doing this or that. Um, maybe they should be doing this or that. But, is there a way that you can show them? Can you, can you deal out mercy in the way that you show them the way that they should be living their life? Can we do that? Instead of hammer on them? Can we show mercy but still bring instruction in the, in the people's lives? I think we struggle with that. Um, because we just go, sometimes you just want to go up to them and grab them and say, What are you doing? <laughs> Can't you see? This is crazy. You can do it. Right? Then don't you want to grab some people and just shake them? <laughs> Slap them. Say, what are you doing? Wake them. But the Holy Spirit will lead you. Yes? Well, Yeshua gives a parable about the rich man, who, or excuse me, the servant who owed his master a million dollars, and the master forgave him because he couldn't repay it. And then he went home and tried to beat a hundred dollars out of one of his servants. And so, you know, he ended up going to the master calling him back and and saying, Fine, you want to be like that, then you're gonna to have to pay every dime you owe me. Yeah. So in that, and that's that that is our last scripture that we're gonna to have to quit, but you brought it up just right at just the right time. Because in that parable, um what is that saying? What is that par parable telling us? The very, the very be attitude that we started with. Right? It says if you want mercy, you deal out mercy. And that, if you don't want mercy, don't deal it out. Then, then, then receive judgment. And uh, that's exactly what uh, the be attitude says. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Um, anybody have anything that they would like to add to the, to the conversation? I'm going to actually stop on time today. Um, and uh, But if you have anything you'd like to add, please do so. Yes? I think when you experience something, it helps you to relate better in your life. So if you feel like you um, haven't been shown mercy in, in your life from other people, I think it helps you sometimes to see how you should treat other people. Because otherwise I think we go through life kind of not awakened in that matter. We're not fully understanding how to treat other people until Yahweh opens our eyes. And sometimes it has to be through other people showing us, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, I know how I'd like to be treated now. I'm not going to do that to someone else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's 
Sounds like we have to sometimes learn the hard way. I mean, we, yeah, go ahead. Well, I think there's a whole other side to this. Okay. All of that. The repentant heart, without the repentant heart, mm -hmm. it, it, it's very hard to receive mercy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that employee wouldn't have got her job back had she not <laughs> had a repentant heart. And that's with all of us. Mm -hmm. We're not going to receive the always mercy without the right. repentant heart. Uh, we're, we're prideful. It's, uh, you know, you're just going to get exactly right. If we are full of pride, we are not going to receive mercy. You gotta be um, wanting and seeking after Him and being repentful in, inside of the things that you've done. You're exactly right, Angie. Sometimes we forget that to, to say that, but that is the, the prerequisite um, in in receiving God's mercy uh, is is being sorry for. But not only sorry, repentance is not only just feeling sorry, it, it, it means that you are you have turned 180 degrees around from what you were doing. And, and, and uh, you said, I'm not going to do that again, but I need your help. I need your help, Holy Spirit, I need your help so that I don't. Please help me um, not to do that again.
How many of, them, of us want the uh, hearts, the eyes of our heart, so we can, uh, we can see Him?
How many know that he is an awesome and majestic God? Let's just worship him again.
Okay. Last week, uh, we were talking about boundary markers of the Holy Spirit, and I had laid out seven, seven things that, uh, that, that I had found that uh, those markers that the Holy Spirit would lead us to. And uh, I want to talk about the first one today. And the first one was brings order out of chaos. Um, brings order out of chaos. And uh, do you know that when that order comes forth, that His glory is being revealed? And uh, that's, that's the name of my message this morning, Revealing His Glory. Revealing His glory. So, order out of chaos. We, we talked about um, the beginning of the book. Um, the beginning of Yahweh's Word. He's shown us what divine boundaries do. Um, the Word says that His Spirit hovered over the formless earth. That means that formless men, it was in chaos. There was no order and it began to set boundaries. He began to set boundaries. And life sprang forth. And the glory of His creation. And, and He was revealed when order came in our life. That is what happens in our life too. You know, just as, it, as the boundaries were set, um, light from darkness sea from land, um, all those things, when those boundaries were set, um, life sprang forth. That's what happens in our, in our life if we let it happen, if, the, if we let the Holy Spirit set boundaries in our life, life will spring forth and His glory will be revealed. When your life is in chaos, when you are in fear, when you are in confusion, it is not of the Holy Spirit. It is an influencing spirit, but it's not of God. It's not of Yahweh. You know, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. But if you're not listening, if you're not listening... Where, this, where the Holy Spirit is telling you to set boundaries in your life. If you're not listening, you're not going to experience that. You're not going to experience His power. You're not going to experience um, a lack of fear, peace, shalom. You're not going to experience a sound mind. Um, all of them are out the door. You are in confusion. You are in fear. Um, and uh, chaos will rule around you. Do you know people um, that uh, are your friends or your family that just chaos seems to be around them all the time? And there always seems to be things in their life that are happening. And, and it's not good things. Um, and if you, if you could sit back and just look into their life, are they following the commands of God? Are they following the Word of God in their life? Mostly, I would say, no. Chaos is constantly around them. It's not. It's not. Um, you'll not experience... Um, the lack of fear. You'll not experience His power, His glory. And you'll not experience peace in your mind. Um, you know, a sound mind is uh, um, one of the, uh, the greatest gifts, I believe, that Yahweh God gives us. Peace. Peace that He is always there. Peace that He has it in control. It's not by your power. Or by your might, but by His Spirit, things will get done. Things for the kingdom. So, when divine order is put in place in your life, 
the glory of God is revealed. Not only to you, but to those that are around you. Divine order is tangible. It can be experienced. And it can be enjoyed. It produces life. It produces life. When divine order came into my life, when uh, the Holy Spirit touched me and, and began to, to uh, tell me the things that I needed to do to put my life in order, um, life sprang forth. Life sprang forth in my, in my marriage. Life sprang forth in my family. And that's what I am. We are talking about today is those things, those boundary markers that the Holy Spirit is, is leading you to will produce life. Now, they might be things that, that you're resisting. I don't care if you, you have uh, followed the Lamb for 45 years of your life. Or it's only been three days. There are things that we are resisting in our life. We have not arrived yet. He is still dealing with us. He is still trying to set uh, order in our life. And uh, I want to look at a, a physical manifestation that, that took place in the Bible when divine boundaries were given to man and to a nation. I want you to go to Exodus 34. Exodus 34. So as we look down through Exodus 34, um, this was the new set of tablets that Moses was, had to chisel out because he broke the first ones and he had to go and, uh, and Yahweh said, go chisel out the second pair and bring them up to me. And uh, so he did that. And uh, in verse 10 he said, the Lord, I am making a covenant with you before all the people. And uh, he started laying out boundary markers. Not only the Ten Commandments, but he also was laying out other uh, markers there. Um, number 17, verse 17 says, Do not make any idols. Of course, that's on the 10. Um, but 18 says, Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. Uh, 19, the first offspring of every womb belongs to me. And uh, as you look down through there, number 21, six days you shall labor, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Sabbath. That's a boundary marker. 22, celebrate the Feast of Festival of Weeks, which we just did. Um, the Feast of Pentecost. And bring your first fruits to me. And uh, as you look down through there, 26, bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. And then we look at 27. I wanna, I'm going to read from there. So, so Yahweh was, was revealing boundary markers to Moses, um, the Ten Commandments, yes, and others. And verse 27 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Moses was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights, without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. Why, does his, why did his face shine? Why did Scripture say his face shine? Because he had what? He had spoken with Yahweh, God. That's, that's why his face was shining. What did Yahweh speak? Boundary markers. He gave him the Ten Commandments. He gave him the Torah. The 
first five books of the Bible. He spoke them out to him. And, and when that divine order was spoken by Yahweh, Moses was in, that, in the presence of that glory and it began to emit from his face that, that glory. And you know that um, I always thought that uh, that, that uh, diminished. Do you know that in Jewish tradition, they say his face shone until he died. His face shone because of, of, uh, of that. Now I said that, that's Jewish tradition. Um, his face shone and, and lit up because he spoke with Yahweh God. Do you know and do you realize uh, we have the same opportunity that Moses had on that mountain. We can speak to Yahweh God any time of the day that we want to. And He will give you instruction as He did for Moses. And when He does, it is divine order. It is order for your life, but it's from Him. And the light of Jesus will shine forth through you. That's part of Yahweh, Yahweh's glory in us. Do you know it? When we set divine boundary markers in our life, that light begins to shine forth to those that are around us. Our um, Connie's memory verse last week. I'm going to read it to you. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It says, you are the light of the world. Maybe I should let you read it. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what are your good deeds? <laughs> what are your good deeds? They are the teaching and instruction that you find in the Word of God. They are your mitzvot. These are your commands. These are your teaching, your instruction. These are your good deeds. And you know what they do? Your good deeds reveal the glory of the Father in heaven. That's what the Scripture just said. Your good deeds, when they, when you put them to work in your life, they reveal the light that is inside you. They reveal the glory of your Father in heaven. So again, I don't care if you've been a follower of Christ for 40 or 45 years or longer, or only a few days, there are areas in your life that where divine order needs to be established. And the Holy Spirit is dealing with you in these areas. And how that started with Moses was what? How did that, how did that, when his face started shining? Because why? He, he spoke with Yahweh God. So how does that start with you? It starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. First thing, before you, your feetsies, before your little feetsies hit the floor in the morning, you thank Yahweh God for that day. It's a day you never, never lived before. And you say to Him, order my day. Order my day. You know, the Apostle Paul was given instruction to Timothy. Um, and, and I want you to turn to 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, I'm going to read. The Apostle Paul was giving instruction to Timothy. Timothy was, uh, they called these the pastoral um, letters. Timothy was a, uh, had served as pastor in, in church, in a church, and uh, uh, he was giving him instruction. And this was one of the first instructions in this, in this letter. And uh, notice 
I'm going to read it to you out of a couple different versions. Um, but the first one, I'm going to read it to you out of the Message, message Bible. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3 says, The first thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how for everyone you know. Pray, especially for rulers and their governments to rule well so that you can be, can be quietly about our business of living simply in a humble con contemplation. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. Alright, I want to read this to you out of another version. Uh, this is out of the Aramaic New Testament, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 3. I encourage you, therefore, in the first place, that you present to Elohim supplication and prayer and intercession and thanksgiving for all men, for kings and magistrates, that we may dwell in a quiet and tranquil habitation with all reverence for Elohim and with purity, for this is good and acceptable before Elohim, our life giver. Prayer is the first step, the first boundary marker we place, and order comes out of chaos, because the Holy Spirit will give you instruction. Okay? Prayer is a basic foundational principle. Basic. And you're saying to me, Pastor, we know this. We, we already know this. Why are you teaching us on prayer today? Why, why are you teaching us such a basic principle? Because I know what I do in my life. And I know it happens in yours. When things are clicking right along and you're doing quite well, it seems like prayer falls off. But when you're in trouble, boy, you're crying out to God. Help me, help me, Yahweh, Yeshua. We need to be consistent. Consistency in our prayer life. That is what I want to talk to you about today. Consistency. Um, so, prayer is work. Prayer is work. You are conversing with the King of the Universe. I mean, it should be, we should be excited. We should be running to our prayer closets to speak to Him. But we get so distracted mm -hmm. in our life. Things get so busy that, uh, oh, I'm going to do this later. I'm going to talk to Him later. Um, and you go off and you forget you forget. So, consistency. This is what I am trying to maybe work on. Now I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you out there. And we need to be consistent. You know, ritual. Everybody knows what that word means. And I think many of us shiver at that, at that word. We hear ritual. Um, we get thoughts of legalism. We get thoughts of mindless, heartless repetition, dry and emotionless. But I want to define ritual for you. It means a practice. It means a service or a procedure done as a rite, especially at regular intervals. Listen. Listen to me today. We are trying to establish boundary markers, we are stuck at boundaries in our life. Divine order that the Holy Spirit leads us to, right? So, we are creatures of habit. Anybody know that? You can have good habits or you can have bad habits, but you're going to have them because you are a creature of habit. And that's what a ritual is. It's a habit. It's something that you do over and over again. Just like smoking. That's a ritual. Just like chewing. That's a ritual. Just like eating. How many of us miss meals? 
<laughs> I'm pretty good at my ritual of eating. Um, time to go to bed. It's a ritual. Um, things that we do on a consistent basis in our life. You know, most of the time I eat at 11.30. And uh, at 11.30, I felt my stomach growl because I was ready to eat. It's a ritual. It's a ritual. Okay? So, we're trying to be... We are creatures of habit, so we are trying to have the right habits, the right rituals, the right order which uh, Yahweh places in our lives. And do you know the more precise uh, that you do something, um, the more consistent that you do it every day, it becomes automatic. Just like that had to eat at 11.30. It was automatic. I got that in my... Uh, built into me, almost. You know, at 11.30 I eat um, lunch. Well, if it's prayer that becomes that way, that we do it precisely every day, at, at the same time, every day, um, it becomes automatic uh, in our life. And uh, it becomes a habit. You know, uh, like Paul said, you know, you're supposed to live a, a life of prayer. But sometimes I don't do that. I don't live a life of prayer. Um, I'm not always talking to God. And, and He has set up in His Word times during the day that we are supposed to be praying to Him. Consistency. Consistency. Habits. You know, I heard... Um, Tanya knows this man. I heard a rabbi in North Dakota. Um, name is uh, uh, Rabbi Ralph Messer. He said, you don't decide your future. You decide your habits. And your habits decide your future. I'm going to say that again because it's it is true. You don't decide your future. You decide your habits. And your habits decide your future. So if your habits are in order and in line with God, um, you are going to be within His will. You are going to be producing life to, the, to yourself and to those around you. If your habits are... Smoking, drinking, and that, those habits are easy to follow. <coughs> Using drugs, we fall into that habits really easy. Really easy. Bad habits. Eating too much. I raise my hand. That habit is easy to fall into. But I want us to become precise in our prayer life. Prayer becomes a habit becomes a ritual and, and and we do it the same time every day. Every time I, and I'm, I'm speaking to you from my heart, every time that I have had a major, major decision to be made, I have received the answer from God in prayer. And then it's been confirmed through His Word and it's been confirmed through People that uh, uh, believers that are that he has set up around me. Um, so prayer is so important, and it needs to become a ritual. It needs to become a habit to us, and a good one. You know, we think a ritual. We think of ah, it's something I have to do. No, this is something that we can do and we want to do. Because we are speaking and talking to Yahweh, the creator of heaven and earth. I want you to look at, at a few scriptures with me today. Go to Psalms 55, 17. First one. 55, 17. We're just setting, setting the, the scriptural times of prayer. Psalms 55, verse 17. It 
says, every morning, or evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. Evening, morning, and noon. Okay, I want you to turn to Daniel 6, verse 10. Daniel 6, verse 10. Daniel 6, verse 10. Who's ever there? Read it out for me. Now when Daniel knew that the right was trying, he went into his house, and his window blew open in his chamber for Jerusalem. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day to pray and gave thanks before his God as he did his four times. Okay, as he had always done. It, it was a ritual in his life. Three times a day. Evening, morning, and noon. And he, and he faced Jerusalem. He faced east. Um, Acts 3 and 1. Acts 3 and 1. It says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Okay? Acts 10 and 9. It says, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approached the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. The scriptural hours of prayer are the third, the sixth, and the ninth hour, which translates to us 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. 9 a.m., noon, and 3 p.m. And I've told you this before, but I just need to bring the, the point up again to you, but on the day of Yeshua's crucifixion, He was crucified at 9 a.m. They nailed Him to the cross at 9 a.m. At noon, darkness came over the whole land. And at 3 p.m., Yeshua breathed His last. So on the scriptural hours of prayer, Significant things happened on the day that uh, Yeshua died. Um, and you'll find that, that He does that throughout all Scripture. Everything that He deems important times, um, He will do things on them times to show us, this is important to me. I want you to see this. I want you to see this pattern. I want you to apply this order to your life. The Son of God, His last day, followed the hours of prayer. Prayer brings order to your life. The Holy Spirit brings forth instruction which can set boundaries, which then reveals the glory of Yahweh to us in the world and to us in the world around us. So, I have an instruction for you today. And I'm going to ask you next week how you did. How many carry cell phones? How many we got in the, in the house? Okay. Carry a cell phone on them. Um, okay. How many have a watch? That's it. That covered by everybody else. Just about anyway. If you have a cell phone, I know for sure that you can set um, alarm. And what I want you to do is set the alarm at night, and at noon, and at three. And uh, I want you to uh, uh, stop. Or whatever you're doing, I, I just want you to redirect your thoughts. Even if you're at work, uh, whatever you're doing, you can stop for a minute, acknowledge um, the presence of the king of the universe and move on. 
but this becomes uh, a, an order in your life that will become automatic. And you will find that uh, uh, when, those hour, when those hours of prayer come up, if, when you've done this long enough, you won't need that alarm anymore. You'll just all of a sudden know, oh, it's 9 o'clock. Pray. Oh, it's it's new. I gotta pray. It becomes automatic. It no longer is uh, um, something that uh, pulls your energy. It actually begins to pull you instead of you thinking, "No, oh, I gotta do this." No, I want this to become automatic because our prayer life, we find instruction in. It. We find instruction in it, and it, it reveals Yahweh's glory in our life and into the world around us. I'm trying to increase the divine order in your life. Mine too. Mine too. Um, because increased order becomes increased productivity. Do you know that? When you've got things set out, have you ever been on a job where you got everything lined out that you're going to do? You get it done quicker. Right? Increased productivity. If you've got to search for the tools and you've got to look under this sheet and over here in the corner and, and uh, um, it just drains you. It drains you. Um, it takes unnecessary energy to do that work. Um, so I'm trying to increase the productivity in your prayer life. So it, it becomes um, consistent. And it, and it becomes uh, automatic in your life. Automatic. So there's a lady told me once. I'm just about done. We're about ready to eat. Um, there's a lady told me once that uh, uh, she knew me before I was saved, before... Jesus changed my life. She looked at me and she said, you know, I can see something about your face. There's more light around your eyes. Um, and you know what? I see that around people that are reading His Word and are in prayer. Um, those that are spending time in the presence of Yahweh God. She could see this on people. She said, I see the, I see the light around your eyes. She could see what the Bible call, calls when Moses' face was radiant. She could see that um, on people today. How many of you want that light? Like, like Moses had. Shining through you to those that are around you. What? Is what is up with that? What is up with that? What is that? You're, there's something different about your face. You are just glowing today. No. Spending time in His presence and uh, in His Word and in prayer. So, I want you to begin a new habit, a good one today. A good one. The hours of prayer. Insert them into your life. Yahweh knew that we would need habits in our life. That we would need boundary markers. So that we could reveal His glory to a dying world. We're a creature of habit. We can either have good ones or bad ones. Let's pick the good ones. And... And, you know, when you, like I said, the more precise you are, and, and Yahweh knew this, he, he set it up that way. Nine noon and three. Nine noon and three. Consistency. 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 Um, let us do that. I challenge you. Put it in your life. Um, you watch. You watch the pro productivity of your prayer life. You will um, become... Uh, it will become easier for you to enter His presence. It will become easier for you to hear His voice. Um, because it is His order. Amen. His order. So praise the Lord.